Hello, and welcome to Northeast Christian Church's online service. We're so excited to have you with us. Make sure to subscribe to NECC on all social media platforms. And to listen to our messages, follow us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Thank you and enjoy the service. So clap our hands and sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. sending us your son and giving joy to the whole world. We thank you, God. We prepare our hearts and we adore you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.
wanted to take a minute to welcome everyone here, especially those of us who are here for the first or second time. We really appreciate you taking a chance on us. I know you can have chosen any other church, but we feel, you know, really special that you chose us. Uh, so if you have a smartphone, there are QR codes on the seat backs in front of you with a Get Connected um, little scanny thingy. Um, if you wanted to go ahead and scan that, fill out as much as you're comfortable with with a Get Connected card uh, virtually, or if you wanted to fill out one manually, and then bring it to the um, visitor center out front in the foyer after church, and one of us will be there to greet you and give you a gift with a coffee mug with lots of goodies in it. Just our way of saying thank you for being here, we appreciate you, and we love you. And at this point, if you wanted to go ahead and direct your attention to the screens for our morning announcements, welcome. Hello, Northeast Christian Church. My name is Michelle, and these are your weekly announcements. The Children's Christmas Choir will be December 19th during both services. Our kids have been practicing a Christmas song, and we can't wait to share it with you. Ages 3 to 12 years old can participate, and snacks will be provided for kids in between services. Our candlelight Christmas Eve service will be Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. Join us as we celebrate Jesus' birth together in a quick 45-minute service. We hope to see you there. 
A new session of our next class will begin Sunday, January 2nd at 9 a.m. This class helps you understand who we are as a church and also gives you insight on our small groups and dream teams. You can sign up now at next at lolag.org. A new semester of small groups will be starting in January. We have a variety of groups that meet in and out of the church that help people's needs. Check out what groups work best for you at ne-cc.org and click on Life Groups. Finally, some of you may have noticed the change in our lobby and the precautions that some people are taking during this cold and flu season. If you go into our front lobby, we actually have bands, red, yellow, and green. And these different colors represent people's precaution level that they are taking. If you have a red band on, stay six feet away. If you have a yellow band, uh, proceed with caution. And if you have a green band on, handshakes and high fives are welcomed. If you missed any of these announcements or would like more info, contact us at office at lolag.org. Thank you and enjoy the service. All right, good morning, Northeast Christian Church. How you guys doing? Good. Well, for the past couple weeks, we have been preparing a song especially for you guys. Um, this is our kids' choir for this year. We encourage you guys to sing along with us, have fun. Guys, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, let's take it away. Thank you, kids. Well done. Well, good morning. 
My name is Ben, and they asked me to do the offering, so I'm here to do the offering. I want to remind you of our ways to give. You can scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you. You can, if you're watching online, you can uh, click the link there. And if you're here in person, you want to give in person, we have boxes at our exits and as you exit the, uh, into the foyer out there. I am thankful that it's Christmas season. Amen. I want to read to you one of my favorite passages from the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9. It says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And it says, you shall increase their gladness, and they will be glad in your presence. And it says, the rod of their oppressors will be broken. And you have to ask, well, how, how is all this going to take place? Well, verse 6 tells us, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. Lord, I'm thankful that you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace, and we gather here together to celebrate that. We thank you for your birth. We thank you for your life. We thank you, Lord, that you're left, you, you left your place in heaven to give us peace and to give us life. And Lord, we, we celebrate that today. And this entire week, Lord, as we approach Christmas, wait, may we not forget why we celebrate, and that is because of your great gift. Lord, I pray that as we give today, that you would, you would bless us, that you would uh, bless this church, bless the leadership here, bless all that they're doing to reach out to so many uh, needy people in our area and around the world. We thank you, Lord, that we belong to a church that gives and that is uh, mindful of your kingdom around us. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning. Merry Christmas. Happy birthday, Jesus. Um, as you came in this morning, you probably received or were offered uh, this, this paper. Two things are on it. One, we've actually, by faith, looked at 21, 22 and said, this is what we'd like to do. And so it's all kind of in place there, but on the back, you'll notice that it's filled with all of the different groups that we have available, and some of them meet in special places, so to find out where that is, simply just call the office and we'll get that information to you. But uh, I, I actually wanted to have Rebecca Belisario come up here this morning. Everyone say good morning. morning. She's a wonderful part of our church with Mark and her two boys, and uh, we just recently had a group that went on a disciples conference. At the end of the day, Jesus did not say, go and make churches. He didn't say, go and make um, buildings, go and make clubs, go and make uh, people who say sinner's prayer. He said, go and make disciples. And uh, some, thought, some conversations came up on this trip, but a couple of great things have been taking place that really center around Rebecca. And I know that that makes you nervous as... Uh, she's just, everyone just look away real quick. Don't look at her. Don't look at her. She make it, just, just let her feel at peace. But, but while we were on this trip, uh, and the whole emphasis was discipleship, which is what our small groups are about, um, she said something profound regarding her discipleship's importance in the home. And I just thought in your own words, maybe you just share that with everyone that you could hear this. Because I, I was like, yes, this is, 
this is what it's about. So, sure. Um, so, I was struck by realizing that discipleship starts in the home, and for so many years, as a young mom, young parents dads included, because everybody is sleep deprived when you have real little ones, you're kind of wondering, what am I even doing besides like changing diapers and wiping up drool? Um, what, what, where's my outreach right now? I feel kind of stuck. And it was like the dawn when I realized that this is it. It's discipleship starting in the home because what greater gift can we give the world but good people, more good people that are Christ followers that can um, lead others to Jesus. Doesn't, doesn't that sound like so practical? How many of you are one of those guilty moms? You're like, I know I'm supposed to be doing more, but I just can't handle it. And I know I'm supposed to love my kids, but they're really making me mad right now. <laughs> it's such a hard phase of life, not only for mom, but also for dad. And, and um, we want you to know that that is the most important ministry of your home, and nobody can say no for you, uh, but nobody can say yes for you with discipling um, your kids as well, too. So we, we, did, this, we did this group of, of people that just sat around and said, what is discipleship? And it's really very, very basic, and we, we put post-its on the wall and said, what are some things that you can do? What are the three things that you should do in order to be involved in somebody's life, but in order for them to be involved in, in yours. You know, if you come to our church and you show up on Sunday and you go home, um, I know this is going to hurt your feelings, but I don't really fully see you as part of this church because you're really not in the community, which is what the church is about. But we, we also realize that that's a hard thing to see. How do, how do we make it more? And what, what do we do to do that? And um, maybe if you could share those three things and how you put them into practice recently with, with some gals. You guys sent a picture. They sent a picture saying, see, we're doing it. And so I'll just have Rebecca share that. And That was Alicia, by the way. Shout out to Alicia for getting us together. Um, but one of mine was being vulnerable, which I'm like a shy, quiet person. I don't really want to like share my business. But... Um, that's the way we connect and help each other. And like even through heartache that we've been through and you feel like, I just want to put this behind me, never think about it again. The, it, you're surprised when you actually can share that with somebody who's in that place now where you were, you've come out of it, and you have something like pearls of wisdom to offer them, and you're blessed by it. Um, so being vulnerable, vulnerable, sharing your story, um, yeah. Having coffee was the other one. Coffee's <laughs> coffee always together. a must. That's one of our um, core eternal values in this church, too. What was the last one? That was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do coffee, be vulnerable, share your story. Yes. And, and it's so simple that it's easy to forget, but it's so natural that you do it. How... Um, I, I find that the, this is the thing that's blessed me as a pastor, is that my job's helpful, yours is crucial. You're responsible for your journey, your family, your growth. And we don't grow in isolation. We grow in community. And it's so important to, to take that risk. I, I think that sometimes we want to, just like what you're saying, we, want, we don't want it to get sloppy. We don't want to share so much that we regret. And there's wisdom in being translucent. But it, I think getting together with people and saying, hey, I totally understand what it's like when you, in that baby phase, and you're probably feeling really bad about yourself right now. I did too, but you don't have to. It's normal, and you know what? Your job is to love that kid, and and you know that you've got a lot going on. It's okay, and and I just think that that really gets us to a higher place where we begin to tell our stories of our testimony of where God brought us. I I find that nothing blesses me more when I hear somebody share of how God change their life. And I really believe that the message of Jesus would go much further faster if we began to do that with people, not only inside our church, but outside of it, that we just simply got together and talked about what God did. Some of you have had tragedies that have taken place in your life. Some of you have had wonderful things happen in your life that people can gain hope from it. And, and that was the essence of what I think I wanted to hear. This is what small groups is all about. And um, we just had Rebecca cross a threshold moment of being on the platform. That was my evil deed. And so 
Let's give it up. Thank you so much. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add or if you're now good. Now I'm up here. You know, um, you're up here. Oh, wow. Now she's a mic hog. All right. Um, actually, <laughs> my husband and I were going to this church for so many years, and I think a lot of people don't even realize that because, especially before we had kids, we'd like come in right uh, on time, sit in the back, leave right when it ended, and not like mingle and felt like, okay, maybe we'll just keep our distance and everything. But once you become a part of the community, you realize like, this is so great. Like we're, we refresh each other. And especially after COVID, everybody was kind of forced to isolate and you almost forget, like you, you've kind of made yourself get by like alone or on your own and you forget what it's like to have that sense of community. And being back together with the women's group, we just had like such an awesome Christmas party. And um, <laughs> it was so great like to have people there side by side. Like the Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, King James Version, born and raised. Um, <laughs> So it's so great to feel that again. And so if you're a lurker, like I was, um, just take the step, find a small group, and you'll be so blessed. Thank you for sharing your story, being vulnerable, and I don't have any coffee for you, but thank you. Can we thank her? <laughs> thank you. And you have a group that's starting up, just a bunch of women. It was a bunch of moms, but moms are kind of busy. But they're a bunch of women. And all the other groups are on there, but this was just a great chance to put it out there. And I love the flash mob connection that took place with the ladies for Christmas. And we hope to do that with the men. I think, I think the guys need to get away for a weekend, like at a couple of Airbnbs and just kind of, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Amen. Yes, I hear that amen. That's it. But thank you so much. Let's thank her one more time. That's great. I'm going to ask Sam to come up. Yeah, here they are. I uh, have a presentation I want to make. And I better keep the microphone nearby, because I know this guy can talk. He, he hates being the center of attention, but he completely forces himself into it because of the stuff he does. But I'm going to ask Adam to come up. And... <laughs> So you, you might not know this about Adam, but he is one, the, the, those of you that maybe do uh, purchases online with Amazon through like every major, major event, every major platform like Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, all that stuff. He actually manages the whole shebang of that. One guy for billions of people. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to say thank you for that next day delivery service. He's the guy, and if it, if it doesn't show up on time, it's not his fault, it's the truck driver. Sorry about that, Kim, I don't know if you're here, but uh, those of you that do it, but during this time of, of COVID, um, I don't know what we would have done. I really don't know what we would have done, and it's, we're not fully in the clear yet. I think we've got some back and forth. We're contemplating going to one service in January and February. We're giving it thought because um, we can fit everybody in one service, and we asked too much of our volunteers already that we want to we wanna keep them fresh and refreshed, but it was in that season where we went from having no online service to, in my opinion, one of the better online services definitely in our region. And, <laughs> It is completely, completely because of this man. And whether you're watching online or you're here in person, I, first of all, Gail, thank you for sharing him with us. And uh, I, we were contemplating in the office, like what would be a cool like Dundee Award to give him? And any of you who know the office, and nobody fits it better than Atlas, the Titan who is holding up the universe. And you, you held up the World Wide Web for us and put the church on that platform. And that was you. You are a Titan of Titans. We appreciate you. I would have flown in a trip to Hawaii, but would budget budget cuts. So, um, you, you know, it's not that uh, God hasn't blessed us with resources at church, but we it's really redirecting resource. And, and right now we're going through the budget and seeing where uh, we can do things in such a way that we can go further faster. And uh, God's going to give us grace, but pray, pray for us as we're looking at the budget on how to 
do things in the upcoming year. Uh, and with all the ministries, I want to say thank you for your faithfulness in being Christians that tithe, being Christians that give to missions and that faith promise pledge that you've made. We are so grateful. As Pastor Dylan said in first service, we've added more missionaries to places in the world where it's illegal to be a Christian. We're bringing the gospel to places where just can't re- it just can't be reached without us as a church getting behind it, but we've also done so much for our community as well, and that's because of you. So, so grateful for that. And so with that in mind here, we've begun our series in the book of Luke, and we are going through the book because we believe that however long God has you with us, we would rather you hear the word of God than the fancy words that I might sometimes throw out there. And so we have everything we ever could ask for in God's book. And if you never heard an audible voice from heaven, um, I'd encourage you to open up the one that we have on earth, his word, the Bible, and just begin to let it marinate in your life. Read just a half a chapter. If you're wondering, I don't know what to do. I want to get back in the Bible for 2022. And my recommendation to you would be simply start in the book of Luke and just read one of those little sections in a chapter and just each day, just trickle away at that. And you'll be following along with a lot of what we're going to be opening up here in church. And uh, maybe you're one of those, I want to read the Bible in an entire year. That's awesome. But you know what? God can do more in your life if you blocked off 10 minutes of prayer and 10 minutes of God's word than a hope to read the Bible in a year and then it just it just never goes anywhere. Just something about when you start in Genesis and then once you start hitting Leviticus, can't you just, although that's my favorite book. Um, but today I want to talk with you both here and online, and we're so grateful for those of you that are watching, for the greatest story never told. I believe the birth of Jesus is the greatest story ever told because we have hope, we have eternity. The, the, the cradle leads to the cross, but if you only have a Christianity that just stops at the cross, it's an incomplete gospel. There were thousands of people crucified. It continues past the tomb and the resurrection and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. He made good and proved that he has the ability to deliver on his promises by being the first one to do it and says, this is what I'll do for you. If you will trust me, if you will put your faith in me, if you will follow me, if you'll let me change you, that's the gospel, the whole gospel. But I think the Christmas story is one of those ones that's the greatest one that's never told. And let me just give a plug here real quick. This coming Friday night at 6 o'clock sharp, Christmas Eve, we have an enchanted moment that we call our Christmas Eve service. We've, we have arbors with lit candles all along the top. It is absolutely amazing. And I'm telling you that I'm telling you every year, 30 minutes, it is over and people are walking out the door. And if, you, and if we're not done in 30 minutes, you can get up and leave. But I'm telling you, what greater place to bring Jesus into your home than making that a priority on that special day. Now, next year, listen to this. Next year, Christmas falls, Christmas Eve is, sat, is Saturday and Christmas is a Sunday. So I want to give you one year's notice on this. It, it actually, Ben, I, I, that shared on, uh, on offering here was the one I heard had done this when he was pastoring. You've heard of Christmas Eve, but have you ever heard of Christmas Adam? See, Adam came before Eve, right? So what we're going to do, somebody said, yes, and amen, All right, is while Christmas Eve is on Saturday, we are going to have our Christmas Eve service on Friday night, Christmas Adam before Eve. When it's a Friday evening, we're going to just pull the stops out, have a great service, and then what we will do is give you Christmas Eve with your families, and Christmas morning, I'll simply do a simple devotion from our family to yours, and we're going to enjoy that weekend with our families. Just seems too much to compete with it or be like, you need to be in church Saturday night and Sunday. But this Friday night, I encourage you to be here, and every time that it's not so close to uh, that date, and so that's a one-year notice. So this, this coming evening, this is where we'll be talking about Jesus, his birth, his hope, the peace on earth, and God's goodwill to all mankind. But as we have one service before that, focusing on Luke, focusing on the Christmas story, 
I want to give you a story that is very unknown to many of us. I've been preaching it here for years, and I do that because it takes so much time for this to soak in, because the tradition of Christmas that, as we understand it, began in around the time of the Crusades in Europe. Jesus and Mary going through the snow, get to Bethlehem, and she's about to burst. They go to the Best Western and Holiday Inn and Motel 6, because uh, the, the Hilton and um, the, the, the Western are all filled up. Nobody has room, and they say, you know what? You can just sleep in the barn with the hay. We'll charge you half price. And that's a story that goes all the way back, but the story of Christmas as we know it is found in Luke chapter 2. And if you have a Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn there. And I'm going to read chunks of this and unpack it. We're going to go from the head, and we're going to end with the heart, and we're going to cap it off with an incredible song this choir is going to sing for us, which thank you so much for what you did earlier, because you guys sounded amazing. And uh, wonderful, wonderful where all of you are behind the bright shining lights. Here it is. Do me a favor. Just read out loud the red with me. Ready? One, two, three. A census, Roman world, all went to be registered, each to his own town. Stop right there. It's a census. All had to register. Everyone had to go to their hometown. When I say go, I want you to yell your hometown. Let's just, let's just yell it out, where your home is, the town where your home is right now, not where you grew up. Ready? One, two, three. Haverhill. All right. So if this was the census, every single one of you would go to wherever it is that you shouted out. And we would all be going to different places because that's the town where your home is. Don't miss how clear Scripture is being on this. <laughs> All right, so in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. It's Caesar, not the Jewish people doing the census. One of the mistakes that we make is we look at the census from the view of the book of Numbers. It's, it's the numbering of the Israelites, the numbering of the tribes. And we begin to look at that event that we have recorded, and we say, oh, that's it. You're the tribe of Judah. You're the tribe of Asher. You're the tribe of Naphtali. You're the tribe of, of um, Issachar. Or, and you all cluster together. How many Issacharians do we have? How many of these do we have? How many of those do we have? It's not that kind of a census. It's not a Jewish census. It's a Roman census. And it says there to be registered each to his own town, and everyone to the town to be registered. It, they did this because this is what the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. In fact, there is in outside of the Bible an account that says that, that the Roman senator was sent to this specific census that the Bible's talking about, and he was sent by Caesar to take an account of their substance. So basically what that is, it says later on that they're basically seeing what they can tax. Any of you who live in the state of New Hampshire understand what property tax is. It's like you're torn. Do I buy a house in Massachusetts where I work or do I live in New Hampshire? Because the, the houses are cheaper in New Hampshire, but the taxes are higher and they go on forever. And pretty soon I think Massachusetts is going to catch up with you and it is going to matter what side of the state line you live on. But understand that this is a taxation. Scripture's really clear on it. The Bible talks about it even outside of the Bible. The history talks about it. And it's very important to where we're going to go with this. So continuing here, it says, So Joseph also went up from Nazareth to Galilee and Judea. Now, if you take a look at where Nazareth is and where Bethlehem is, Nazareth is in the north. Isn't that bad? <clears throat> Thank you. So it's, it's, you always spiritually, whenever you go to the area where the temple is, you always ascend up. And so it's just language that they use there. But here he is. Now look at this. He's, he's going up to Jerusalem. So Joseph 
It says, so Joseph also went up from Nazareth into Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. Now, of course, that's where the tribal territory was. The, the Romans were in charge of the area there, but it wouldn't be uncommon for you to be trying to take back your inheritance by property in that area. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged, who was betrothed. And we talked about that. That's like you're married, but you're not able to, to be together yet physically for a year. So to be married to him and was expecting child. How many months was she pregnant at this point? See, you can't say because it doesn't say. We assume and we presume Mary is just about to burst here, but we don't know. What we do know is that there's a census of the Roman world that everybody had to register, each to his own town. So Joseph went to Bethlehem. He went there to register because they're going to tax him on a home. What? Wait a second. How in the world would... I, I thought that Joseph was from Nazareth, right? This is the kind of story that we hear all the time. How could he have a home in, in Bethlehem? They stayed in a hotel. The Bible says it clearly. I want you to think with your head with me for the first part of this service. Because once we get that fixed, we're going to drop down to our heart. And you're going to realize that this is actually the greatest story never told because of the way we've been looking at it. And Nazareth is in the north. It's actually a beautiful, beautiful city in a bowl. You could sit on the edge of the cliffs that the Bible talks about Jesus. They were trying to push him off of the edge. And you can look out and see the visually right in front of you almost all of the events that took place in the Old Testament. You could see the hill where Gideon and his men outnumbered 300 to 10,000, defeated the army by the grace of God. You could see where Deborah and Barak fought against the Canaanite king of Hazor and came out the victor. You can look across there and see the mountain where Elijah called down lightning on the fire and proved that God is Lord and not Baal. You can look out and see the cities where Ahab ruled and Jezebel drooled and all of this kind of stuff that's in front of you right there. And you can just picture Jesus his whole life while he's growing up from from being a young man into adulthood. And he's there and he's looking. You can, you can see right there your view is to see all of this stuff. And it says in the Bible that they went from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that, my friends, is a three-hour drive, about a week-long walk. It's a long distance. So it's beautiful. In fact, the three oldest churches in the world, two of them are in the city of Jerusalem, but one of them, built by Constantine's mother, is actually right in Bethlehem. And this is the Church of the Nativity, which I would propose to you, without debate this morning, is most likely the place, the area where Jesus was born. And what's beautiful is, if you notice it, they have it shaped in the shape of a cross. What's funny is, is that the left side's Catholic, the right side's Armenian, and the middle is Eastern Orthodox, and they all fight for supremacy for thousands of years over everything else. You go in there and it's just amazing, the columns, and I'm looking at stuff and I'm like, this goes all the way back to the Emperor Constantine, where his mom commissioned this. It's just, it's amazing to see the Bible. And by God's grace in February, I'm hoping that we're there. I don't know yet, but notice I got a red band on, please don't give me COVID, I wanna go to the Middle East. Um, it's the place where David grew up. It's the city of shepherds. It's it's an amazing place. It is the tribe of Judah's territorial inheritance. And we know from the line that the, in the genealogies, Joseph was legitimately a descendant of King David himself. And so him being from this area, it's huge. But look at what happens here. It says that they were registered. He, he went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be betrothed, to be married to him, and was expecting child. How far along was she? We don't know. It's important. Because if you picture Mary ready to pop, you instantly rush them into Bethlehem under different reasons. While they were there, how long were they there between when she was expecting child 
and the time came for her, for the baby to be born, she gave birth to a firstborn son. We don't know. See, we create a timetable in our mind, and we're using our mind here for the first part of the service, that Joseph and Mary are from Nazareth, that they go to Bethlehem because of a census, because they're Joseph's from the tribe of, of Judah, and we rush them down there, and we have Mary on a donkey. She's pregnant with snow. I've only seen in the 20 times that I've gone to Israel snow once, and it was like a, an amazing anomaly, uh, but it's not a place of snow. And, all of the, and then he goes to a barn, and all of those are kind of these ideas that don't make sense. We know that when Jesus was born, that while they were there, at the time came for, her to, uh, for, for, her, uh, for the baby to be born, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling cloth and clothes. Swaddling cloth is King James, by the way. Um, placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. Now, here's where I'm going to need you to keep your head and your mind working with me because here I'm about to make some steps that will actually help you understand the story of Christmas as it was versus as we've come to know it. When I see a manger they're in the Middle East, they're always made of stone, and they're feeding troughs for animals. So when I see that, I say, well, Jesus is born in a barn, right? Because um, here he is, he's, there's a feeding trough right there. And that just makes sense because animals aren't in homes, they're in barns. But I'd like you to see that the greatest story never told us is that Jesus was not born in a barn. He was born in a home, in the home of Joseph, surrounded by love. Track with me here. Watch this. The Bible verse states this, that she placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. Now here's where two things help us to see the story for what it really is versus what we've come to know it to be. First, the word that's used for inn, when I say inn, you think holiday inn, days inn, western, best western inn, and we think mobile, we think a place where you stay, you rent it, and we find out, we don't see a barn mentioned anywhere, we assume there's a barn because there's a manger mentioned. Now, in the, in the Greek language, the word here that's used for in is a thing called katalumatai. Now, you don't even have to speak or understand Greek to get this. Listen to this. There's a ministry that we're working with that's helping with Afghan refugees. And what the biggest need is right now is helping them with two things, with their dietary needs because of their diet and how they eat. They can't just eat anything. They can't just eat pasta and cheese. And so many in this church have been helping prepare food for them. But the other is a ministry that works with some of the people we support actually as missionaries. And it's a group called Kataluma. And that word literally means home. It's the Greek word for home. It's the Greek word for not specifically just a home because it's the special area of the home where you sleep, the katalumatai. And they're working with us to help find housing for people who have no housing right now. And the Bible uses this word right here, and yet we translate it in. It's almost as if they didn't know what to do with it. So what, what is this? And the problem is, is because when a lot of the translations started, a lot of the archaeology wasn't where it needed to be, but this is where archaeology helps us. Now look at this. This is a home that the way homes looked like in Bethlehem, in Nazareth, and all throughout Israel, all the way from, with little changes from the time of King David all the way up through the time of Jesus. This is your typical uh, home and the way it worked. On the top floor is a bedroom, and it's tiny. It's not just only a bedroom, but it's also a room where people would gather if it was windy and they'd be tight. It's also the same word, katalumatai, is where the disciples had the Last Supper. And if you know from the reading of that account, they're leaning against each other. They're, John's leaning up against the chest of Jesus. They're all reclining. So it's a really tight place for people to hang out. But in English, 
sometimes we just don't have enough words. The Greeks used seven words for love. We just say love, right? You love your wife. I love my dog. I love my pickup truck. I love my country music, right? We, we have one word for love. The Greeks were like, this is not enough. And so they did things like eros and phileo and agape and, you know, on and on and on. We could just go, but because some, sometimes there just aren't enough words in any language to do it. But when it comes to a house, if I were to go back in time and say to somebody, hey, I'm in the powder room, but I'll be out in a minute, they'd be like, what is the powder room? I do not know this. If I went back to the time of the Revolutionary War, hey, I'm going to the powder room, right? They'd be like, what? Are you, are you helping the British? Is there a store power of powder keg in there? You know what I mean? Like, what, what, we don't understand it. So when I say to you, a katalumatai, and you're an English writer, you're going to be like, I don't get it. Are they at a hotel? And you put in. But the katalumatai is this upper room, and it's the place where everyone come together. In fact, the Harvard Semitic Museum has a replica of these houses right there. If you've never been there, it's a great place to go. Just don't go on Saturday because they're closed for Sabbath on the Jewish holiday, Shabbat. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. We assume that Joseph is from Nazareth because we have him mentioned there. But we also know that Mary goes all the way down to Jerusalem to meet her cousin when she's pregnant, Elizabeth. And the baby jumped in her womb when they met each other. So it's not uncommon for families and travel. It's not uncommon for people to be in arranged marriages in other parts of the world even today. But in that world, that was the way it always was. And so people would, would, they would look to somebody and say, oh my goodness, Mary, you couldn't have made a better match them with Joseph. He is from royal stock, the line of David. And then, and then Joseph would have been like, oh my goodness, Mary, she's from the line of Aaron, the priest, the great priest, the brother of Moses. This is a, a great Jewish match. And they made all those plans. And then all of a sudden an angel shows up and just God drops a, plan, a bomb on plan A and it becomes plan B. So what I'm proposing to you is this. The greatest story never told is that Joseph does not live in Nazareth. He owns a home in Bethlehem. Why do I say that? For two reasons. Number one, because he goes home for the census where he has property. He goes there because he's going to be taxed on property because that's where the tribe of Judah was trying to reclaim their territorial right. Makes sense that he has a home there. He's betrothed to Mary who is from Nazareth. And then when they go there, Jesus is not being born in a barn in the back stable, but if you look at the homes of this part of the world, on the top floor is this bedroom, this katalumatai. The roof is a place where you sleep when it's hot, 100 degrees sometimes in the night. I've been there without AC, it's terrible. But down below, inside, is where you did your food storage. Not only that, but it was also where... On the lower floor, if you look in the lower right here, if you had an animal that was pregnant, if you had an animal that you were preparing for sacrifice, if you had an animal that was wounded, you would bring them into your home. The rest of them you keep outside, like David did, tending the sheep out in the wilderness. They had to go run and find him, but you would bring that animal inside. So let me stitch this together for you real quick. What in the world are you saying, Pastor Paul? What I'm saying is that Jesus was not born in a barn. He was born in a home surrounded by love, surrounded by people. Now, here's the part where it's going to seem a little, it's going to be easy for you to track this, and we're still in our head on this story, so hang tight with me. There is another place in the Bible where the word in is used, where upper room is used, and it's in the story of the Good Samaritan. Bible says a guy's beat up in the wilderness, a priest walks on one side, a Levite walks on the other, the people who should be helping this guy aren't, a Samaritan who would be like the equivalent of a gang member today, he goes up, he sees the guy, he throws him on his donkey, he takes him to a inn. Now in English, we only have one word for this, so we 
say, oh, that must be an inn, right? That's a hotel, which it is. But the Greek is saying something completely different. It's saying pondexion. He takes him to a pondexion. He takes him to this hotel and drops him off. The Bible itself, if you read it in the original language, you would catch that where Jesus is born is in an upstairs room and not in a hotel room. And here's what's even more important with it. When you, I, I, say, this, I say this all the time, I love, I love you all, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we're a Christian, when you like to be a Christian too, right? But you don't know how to party like my Jewish friends party. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, 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 hey. Like, the, you can go to Jerusalem when the celebration feasts are happening. I've been there during um, the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Pentecost, and you're walking through the gates. You can't even get 15 feet without a crowd of 50 people bouncing in a circle, grabbing your hand and pulling you in and dancing. And in the middle, there's a whole bunch of people going, whoa, whoa, this is great. It's like, Fiestive, like you might take white out to everywhere in the Bible where it says dance and your weddings. Oh my goodness, they are really, yeah, exactly. Your weddings, right? You, you, you know, uh, by the power vested in me by the state of Massachusetts and by Lord God Almighty, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may peck your wife on the lips. God bless you. Thank you. No way, man. You know what they're doing with the bride and the groom? They've got them up on a chair and they're going, hey, 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 hey. I worry for the safety of every bride and groom every time I see a Jewish wedding. It's like, oh my goodness. They celebrate. And Jesus, Joseph has already had a dream. He already has heard from God through the, arch, the, the Michael the angel to take Mary as his wife. Mary has already had a dream that she would, that the Holy Spirit would create within her a child that would be fully man, her, but fully God, him, and that she would give birth to the Savior of the world. He, he told Joseph, you're going to be the defender and the protector of this child and this woman so that God's plan could be fulfilled. But that's a hard secret to keep, especially when someone starts showing, right? Right? And I said this before, but like through the years, I've had so many young couples come in my office and we're like, they're not married. And they're like, uh, we just don't know how it happened. And I'm like, hey, this ain't the virgin birth. We know this. I can tell you exactly how it happened. But Mary and Joseph were not going to have that kind of ability to have conversation like that. Like a good man, that guy was maybe willing and considering maybe, maybe going to Nazareth. I don't know. Maybe Mary was going to go with him, most likely to Bethlehem, which was the way it happened. But he couldn't keep her in Bethlehem any longer. So God spoke to him. God spoke to her. We don't know how long the process is. I think Mary knows she's pregnant, but she's not showing. God says to Joseph, you take this woman, and he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to speed up the process. I've got to go back to Bethlehem. There's a census that's happening. Mary, come home. And he brings her to his home. And while they were there, the time came for the child to be born. So when they're in Bethlehem, everybody is expecting, okay. They had what's called in the betrothal part, the homecoming ceremony. When your bride lives under the same roof as you do, they fast tracks that. So everybody is assuming that it's Joseph's child, which here, this is a great picture of a man trying to protect the dignity of a woman. He takes her into his home. But when Jesus is being born, this is the hard part to understand. He put him on, his, uh, uh, he, the Bible says that he was placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn, right? Well, how do we make sense of it? We know that this, the part where Jesus is about to be born is in this area called the Cotalumatai. Instead of saying inn, we should say the upstairs uh, inside room. There's not enough room. We know, good grief, we've, we've seen from the pictures here that it's a tiny room, right? And this is an actual one. This is a tiny area, so it's not, there's not a lot of room. In Judaism, the reason why I celebrate how celebratory they are is because they are also that way when it comes to the birth of their children, which means that Mary, Mary's mother, Joseph's mother, if she was alive, aunts, uncles, nieces, all of the girls would be there 
for this celebrated event. And so basically, the way that you read this from an accurate point of view, the time came for Jesus to be born, and she placed him in a manger. Well, what's he being placed in the manger for? There's the whole roof and the upstairs. There wasn't enough room up there, probably because Jesus was not born in a barn. He was born in a home surrounded by love. And so they go downstairs to the lower part of the house where there is a manger, a place where you can turn. You see, every home had a manger. In our world, we have a garage. In the farms, we have stables. In the Western world, we have barns. And so the Christmas story during the time of the Crusaders forward shifted to Jesus being born in a barn in an inn. But prior to that time, it was never told this way. It literally was told the story all the way up until the Middle Ages where the gospel reached into our world and we made it make sense to the way that we understand it. Jesus wasn't born in a barn. He was born in a home surrounded by love, which makes Joseph's family, Mary's family, and Joseph the greatest keepers and protectors of secrets the world has probably ever known. Every single one of us knows somebody, and probably you're like me and you are that person that just has a big mouth. And then there are those other people, like my father-in-law, who's able to look at a situation and just be like, mm-hmm. And he could go and share all kinds of stuff, but he doesn't because he's a great keeper of secrets. There's, there's those moments where somebody says something hurtful to you and you know you could throw out a line. You could throw out something that they said or something they did and totally gain the upper hand and humiliate them, but not Joseph. Joseph's like, I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to be that guy. Well, why in the world, Pastor Paul, I kind of get this, but why in the world would you even suggest this? This is messing me up. Like Joseph has a home. Here's, here's a real catch for you, and this is another one just to throw on the fire here. The Bible says that Herod came to kill the child, right? So God warns Joseph in a dream to go to Egypt. And so he goes down to Egypt with Mary and Joseph, and the wise men have given them gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which is a king's ransom. So he's most likely keeping them safe in Egypt, living off of that gold that frankincense and that myrrh, selling off the spice, which the spices were worth their weight in gold. And he has this fortune that God has given them to be able to care for them in a refugee status, in a refugee state. But their heart is always to get back. You know, the Bible says only in three places, you shall love, that phrase, only in three places in the Old Testament, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbors yourself. The third one is this, you shall love the foreigner that's among you. What's amazing about Jesus is, is that if what Pastor Paul is saying right, and I'm telling you it's right about the Christmas story, Jesus was surrounded, born in a home, surrounded by love by Joseph's family. But he also knows what it's like to be a refugee, like many of these people that have found their way into our country under difficult circumstances. And God says, you shall love the refugee, the foreigner that's among you. This is actually Pastor Dylan to give him credit. He's like, I never saw that, that the God of all the universe knew what it was like to be in a family, but also to be on the, on the run, fleeing as a refugee, and also what it was to move someplace. And now watch this. This is where it supports Joseph's home. Watch this. In the time that Joseph and Mary flee and go down to Egypt, Israel is not the tribes of Judah and all of this. It's all under Roman control. And so they go down to Egypt. And Bethlehem is in Judea. But look at this, this, this verse that pops up here. It says, Joseph, after being warned in a dream, went away to the district of Galilee, and there he made his home in a town called Nazareth. The, the reason that that's profound is because right before that, it says this, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, went to the land of Israel, 
But when they heard that Archelaus was ruling in Judea in the place of, of his father Herod, they were afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of the Galilee and they made their home there. In other words, he, when he was leaving Egypt, was headed back to Bethlehem, to Judea. Why is he doing that? The reason he's doing that is because that's where his home was. Because the story as I'm giving it to you is actually the way that it was. And so what's the problem? Basically, Herod was such a vicious man, he killed two of his sons because they would be a threat to his power. And his son Archelaus was just as horrible and miserable, but he had two other sons ruling in different areas that were a little bit more safer. And so the decision is made after being warned in a dream not to go back to Bethlehem. They go to Nazareth. Do you see the tension there? They run away. And if you were running away, why would you go back to a hotel? You wouldn't. You'd go back to your home. But now he knows that his home is still not a safe place. So why not go up to Mary's family? And the Bible says there, and this is why he was called a Nazarene. See, the greatest story never told is that Jesus wasn't born in a barn. He was born in total secrecy in a home surrounded by love. But I believe that not only with that, the greatest story never told is Joseph. We hear so much about Mary and we hear so much, obviously, as we will on Christmas Eve about Jesus and his birth, but we hear so little about Joseph. I, would, I have a, a mentor of mine, a professor of mine, I would even say a friend of mine, who used to always say this to me, Paul, after I meet Jesus, of course, after I see my family, after I meet Jesus in heaven, the first person I want to meet is Joseph. Said because, you see, we get this idea that Mary is highly favored and Joseph is a righteous man because God chose them to watch over Jesus. And we get this idea that God just closed his eyes and tossed his son and the, the greatest plan of the universe to redeem man and the one to do it just randomly in a home. And we said, the poorer the home, the better, because that'll learn, he'll, he'll learn through hard knocks. And we think that God just did this. No, God looked throughout all of the earth and an angel went out of his way and said to Mary, you who are highly favored, Grace to you, you gracious one, you who have found grace with God. This woman was dripping with grace and elegance and godliness. And if I could just put out a plea one more time to the ladies in this church, the world needs women that are godly again. They, we need young women that can bear the term virgin until the day that, they, that they're married. We need people who are righteous again. Mary was not highly favored because she carried Jesus in her womb, she was highly favored by God because she lived a godly life and God picked her. But I also would tell you this, the Bible calls Joseph a righteous man, Dikaios. He is a righteous and holy godly man and he's not that because he would protect Jesus and watch over Mary. He was living that way long before she showed up. And the world does not need another foul-mouthed punk what the world needs is a man who is righteous, who is what God has made us to be, defenders, protectors, providers. And there isn't a woman in there. You always wonder why like, the ugly guys get all the beautiful girls, because they've learned the lesson all of us got late in life, is, is that ladies are not looking for, you know, like, it's looking for somebody that's sensitive. He's just, I love him. What do you, what do you mean love him? He's just kind. I'm still working on that in my life. But, but, but you look at Joseph and what a godly man he is. Look at, look at the story. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. The greatest story never told in the Christmas story is the story of Joseph. Those of you listening online, uh, we, we'll even put these up online eventually here so you guys can grab these and read and reread them. But listen to me, listen, listen to me. The Greek word that's used there, dikaios, is, is the word for righteousness. But if you look 
at the Jewish word for this, it's actually hasadim, hasadik, tzadik. The, 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 it refers to Joseph, the, the better way of putting it is a pious man, a righteous man, the righteous ones. And all throughout Jewish literature in the first century, they talk about a specific group of Jews that Josephus does not talk about. There were literally hundreds of Jews, just like there are hundreds of sects of Christianity, there were hundreds of versions of Judaism. <coughs> One of these groups were called the Hasidim. Look at what one of them says in light of what we just read about Joseph. <clears throat> this is this group of Jews talking about the people and who they are. They're, they're all the way in Persia, and they're talking about people in the West in Palestine, and they say, what do people carefully avoid in the West in Israel? He replied, above all else, putting others to shame. Oh, my goodness, what the world can do with a man that says, rather than putting that person to shame, I would rather just put this away quietly. There'd be no need for Judge Judy, right? Do, 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 do. This was a righteous man. This was a man that said, I would rather take the hit on my chin than give this woman a hit. See, if he turned around and went public with the news that Mary was pregnant, she would have been, she would have been put out in the street, her child would have starved. She eventually would have starved. She probably would have had to have turned to prostitution because there's no hope for you if your family rejects you. If they, she was taking a huge risk, and we talked about that the other week, but, but here Joseph, he has a chance to totally put this girl on shame and display, but he's not that man. What the world could do with a bunch of men when they have a chance to do the wrong thing, that they do the right thing, and, the, and somebody says, oh man, you should do this, you should do that, and then that they would respond and say, but I'm not that guy. I'm not that man. I'm not that person. What kind of person are you, Joseph? You're a righteous and a pious man. Look at how this group of Jews is talked about in the time of, of Jesus and prior to it. The pious men, the Hasidic it says, the men of old used to wait an hour before they said the prayer, the tefillah, that they might direct their heart towards God. Well, they weren't the kind of people that walked in and said, Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name? Give me some daily bread. I got to pay the rent. I got to do... These were men who were so godly that they would sit still, sometimes as long as an hour, waiting so that they didn't make a fool of themselves with their speech before God. Humble, pious. Of course Joseph is going to put away the matter quietly with Mary. There's whole massive segments of this particular group of Jews. And what's interesting about this group is, is that they valued people above precepts. And when you look at Jesus, again, you've got to be careful not to just look at him, the divine Savior born, speaking every language in the world, knowing every mathematical equation, being able to uh, solve every problem. No, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature before God, but also before men. In Judaism, a father did two things for every child. They taught them a trade, and they taught them Torah. Your Bible learning did not come from Bible school. It came from your father. What does that tell us? That tells us that if Jesus was fully human and growing in wisdom and knowledge before God and man, that Joseph was a major shaper of Jesus' life. Here's one for you. When we see Jesus in the temple, we think vertically. Mary comes back and says, where have you been? Your father and I have been worried sick. We've been looking everywhere for you. And Jesus says this. He says, oh, mom, don't be mad at me. Be proud of me. Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? And we look up like this. We're in actuality. It's so most likely he was honoring Joseph, saying, mother, didn't you know I needed to be about my father? and all that he taught me honoring him. When you were 12, you were considered a man, and now you were permitted to speak among the men. And when Jesus does that, 
they say, who is this kid? And ask the worship team to come up as we close. And here's what I would say to you. The greatest story that's overlooked so often is Joseph. See, Joseph, I know we have Father's Day. I really think we should have Stepfather's Day. In a world that is so torn, the world needs men that are willing to look at children that aren't even theirs and say, I'll take that responsibility. Apostle Paul said it like this, you have many teachers, but you do not have many fathers. And many of you grew up in step situations. And your classic line when you're pretty much from 10 to 18 is, you're not my dad. I'll never forget a parking lot, a guy holding up a sign with a bunch of kids around him. He says, I'm not the stepfather. I'm the father that stepped up. That deserves respect. And Joseph, being a great man that he is, so great that he was not only willing to put away Mary quietly, but was also willing to put away his life quietly and dedicate it to the protection and the preservation of the greatest gift that God would ever give this world, Jesus. Sheltered them, watched over them, provided for them, blessed them. At the end of the day, there isn't much we can give, but a father's blessing. My goodness, the world is filled with need for it. Back in the 70s, a man was looking for his son, and he couldn't seem to find a way to reach him. They had a terrible falling out, and he wrote in the paper, he said, Dear Paco, show up in the square in Barcelona, in Spain, and all will be well. And the father showed up that day. Not only was his son there, but 250 other young men named Paco. If ever there was a time for men to be men, it's now. Be bigger than your family. It's time for you to love and give time to your nieces and your nephews, to your neighbors. And it's also with wisdom, right? You never want to be alone with a minor or be accused of something. You want to also, as a stepmom, you want to protect your kids. I wouldn't just hand them off to anybody. But my goodness, if there was ever a time that we needed, th there are so many things we could do in this church. We could have Royal Rangers and Missionettes. We don't have anyone to do it. We could, we could make a difference with the young children in our city and surrounding area that are actually, believe it or not, homeless. Can you imagine what that life is like? Jesus knows. He was in Egypt. If ever there was a greatest story never told, it's the story of Joseph. I want to be that man the best I can. Not perfect, but the best I can. No better song could capture this than us to conclude here with a blessing. And that's what this song is. That what God would bless you. I don't care what your past was like. Where you came from doesn't matter. Where you are and where you go from here is what matters. And choosing blessing is what you have the power to do. Nobody can make that choice for you. But to say, God, I may not have had what I wanted, but I'm going to be what people need. And I'm going to bless my children and my children and their children and their children. And that is exactly what Joseph did. Joseph took a child that wasn't his that turned out to be the most significant gift that God would ever give this world and gave stepfathers the greatest reputation they could ever have. Be the father that steps up and be blessed this holiday season. He's for you. You're free to go after this. God bless you. Thank you again for being with us today. To listen to our messages, follow us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And go to ne-cc.org for all news, events, and updates. Thank you and God bless.